we're going we're gonna, to uh, journey in faith over these next few weeks. And uh, we, we love to build faith. Whenever we certainly get into a time of season uh, and a season of sowing, we always speak to harvest, not to seed. There's one thing I know about Christians, they're great at seed. You guys are just ridiculously generous. Christians are ridiculously generous. Ha- have been for millennia. The very first church were just ridiculously generous. They took, they took uh, orphans in and housed them in a culture and a civilization, ancient Rome, where life was so dispensable, but the church was just ridiculously generous, took them in. Uh, the sick were often discarded in the streets, but the early church took them in. And, and, and for millennia, the, the Christian church has led with one of the most powerful weapons of generosity at our disposal and established. Still to this day, even in Australia, at the last time I checked this, seven of the ten largest charities in Australia were Christian-based. So, so over millennia, still to this day, Christians are still the most generous people. Australians are actually the most generous people in the world. If you look at charitable giving, uh, Australians are the most generous people in the world. And out of the Australians, Christians are the most generous of the Australians. So you are the most generous people in the whole world. Well done. But but you know what I I find as a pastor, what I need to speak to more is not your seed, because you guys are ridiculously generous. I need to speak to your harvest, because we often, we give without regard, and we give without faith, and we give without an expectation of harvest. And so then when we see a lack of harvest, we then question the seed. But it wasn't the seed that was the problem. It, It was the harvesting cycle that we entered into. And not just a personal gain of harvest, but a a harvest in the kingdom of God. And so we need to not only just be uh, generous servants, but we also need to be faithful and diligent. That once you plant a seed, you actually need to water it. You need to fertilize it. You need to protect it. You might need to put some herbicide on it, some pesticide on it. You might need to keep the crows away. And you might need to let that seed come to fruition. When, When Jesus was giving the parable of the sower, Uh, He was using the illustration of seed, how there are many reasons it could fall on dry ground, it could be stolen by the enemy, it could be choked by weeds. There are many reasons why a seed doesn't come to fruition. But our job isn't just in planting the seed, is to make sure that the soil is fertile and that it comes to a full harvest. Now the seed in that particular parable is the Word of God. The Word of God is seed. But it's also true of all the seed that we sow in faith. When we sow a seed of faith, whether it be word seed, rhema seed, Logos seed or, or, or a supernatural seed, we need to make sure that we oversee it and fertilize it with the Word of God, with obedience, with diligence, with, with sticking to it, not letting the enemy come and steal our faith, not, not letting the chokes of this world come and drown out our harvest. Uh, that, that's part of a, 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 an obedient servant's life, is making sure that we get the harvest that we planted for. This could be your children. Like you've planted seeds into your children. I I stand in faith over that. They will come to the Lord. Your grandchildren, they will come to the Lord. There's seeds of faith. It could be be your own uh, peace and well-being. You're sown in faith for wellness and wholeness. Then then stand in faith. Don't let let the enemy come and rob you of your seed. Don't let the chokes of this world... Uh, you, you know, uh, come and, 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 and worry you or bring anxiety over your harvest, like you need to stand in faith, stand on the Word of God. And so this morning, I, I just want to, I, I want to just spend the next few moments talking to you about a, a very simple phrase in the Bible, which can often be very controversial, but mostly because it's either been misused or misunderstood. And, and we have in Christian theology a very bad habit of throwing babies out with bathwaters. And I want to, I want to specifically talk to a, a line that's actually mentioned by John in, in the third John. And he says this, I pray that you may prosper. I pray that you may prosper. Do you know the believer's natural environment is to prosper? Now, I know that there has been a, uh, a, a misuse occasionally of that term prosperity and there has been a misuse of that potentially through various ministers. I I think it might be over-exaggerated, that misuse. I think actually most of the attack against that word prosperity is actually not not a realignment of bad theology but just an attack on the general understanding of what God's trying to do in the world and try to do in the church. 
I mean, if you were Satan, wouldn't you want to make the church the most broken, poverty-ridden people on the planet? I mean, and if you can convince them of that, job's done. If you can believe the church that they're not blessed, that they're not prospering, they're not meant to be flourishing, that they're not meant to be wealthy and, and healthy and, and living in wisdom and with sound relationships, not riddled with anxiety or depression or having brokenness in their life, if you can convince them that that's actually not part of salvation, aren't, aren't you winning? Uh, so so I, I, I think, well, well played. You've done a pretty good job on that. Because we've got Christians literally trying to argue from a theological perspective that, that, that wholeness is not part of salvation. That the only part of salvation is to get to heaven. That's just, that's just nonsensical. And it has absolutely no biblical basis for it to imagine that Jesus went to the cross, died, rose again, resurrected powerfully over all enemies that ever leveled an accusation against us, he undid everything that Adam lost in the Garden of Eden, but we can't ex experience any of it until we get to eternity. Wow. How you come to that theological conclusion, I do not know, outside of, and in a very deliberate attempt from the enemy to confuse you, yeah. to discombobulate the scripture at hand, and to, to totally rework the understanding of what Jesus has brought to our lives. And so here now an apostle, I saw this on Facebook, uh, the reason I titled this, I pray that you may prosper. And we won't be able to put that on YouTube. That'll be way too controversial. But I, I saw this. Uh, somebody, somebody said, I pray that you may prosper is not a doctrinally sound belief, but it's merely just a greeting from an apostle in a letter. I mean, the stupid things you see on Facebook. <laughs> Seriously, by that same theological reckoning, every time Paul says, grace and peace be multiplied to you, now, obviously, that's not scriptural. That's just a salutation by my own hand, Paul the Apostle. He doesn't actually want you to grow in grace and peace. It was just a signing off. Wow. Like, seriously, have you fallen on your head? <laughs> no, actually, upon further inspection, if you actually open up Scripture, it turns out that God wants His children to flourish. I know that's like just mind blown that the good God Almighty created children and family and wants them to be happy, healthy and safe, protected, not riddled with all the cares of this world. But see, here's the thing. We would naturally want that for our children. Like I've got, I've got kids. I want them happy. I want them filled with joy. I want them healthy. I don't want them diseased. I don't want them broken. I, I want them wealthy. I want them looking after. I want them flourishing. I want their relationships flourishing. I want their marriages flourishing. I want them to be prospering in everything. I want their soul to prosper. But somehow we, we understand that as a natural parent, yet we think that God isn't as good a parent as what we are. That we're a better father than what God is. That God, the Father, doesn't want His children happy and healthy and wealthy and sound and living in wisdom and flourishing in all the areas of their life. No, He wants them miserable and broken, poverty-stricken. But that's okay. One day, someday, you get to go to gold streets in heaven, but not until then. You're going to have to live in misery until then. Give me a break. <laughs> and so we need to seriously come back to a reckoning of Scripture. Now, you can take it too far the other way. I get that. I get that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, the point of salvation is not so you can drive a Lamborghini, sure, okay. If you really need that pointed out, then we've got bigger problems in your reading of Scripture anyway. But here's the point. The point is God's plan was always for humanity to prosper. Always. And He hasn't moved off that plan. Matter of fact, humanity moved off that plan and God went about fixing it to make sure that everything Adam lost in the garden, which was abundance, his presence, his protection, his provision, his health, his, his wholeness, or let's sum it up this way, his peace. Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden in the full peace of God. What does peace mean? Well, let's use that word, dude, shalom, right? Which means nothing missing, nothing broken, everything whole. There was, there was a wholeness between us and God. There was nothing missing, nothing broken between us and God. There was a wholeness between Adam and Eve. There was nothing missing, nothing broken in that relationship of intimacy between man and wife. There, there, was, there was no brokenness in their, even in their friendship. I mean, not in their marriage, but even in their friendship. 
It wasn't until after the fall that the first murder happened. Cain fell out with Abel and the first murder. Now there's, there's strife. That, that didn't exist in the Garden of Eden. And you know what? Here, here's the number one thing the church needs to get a revelation on. That poverty is not a financial term. It's a spiritual one. Poverty did not exist in the Garden of Eden. It's a result of the fall and the curse. And Jesus came to reverse the curse. Poverty is a spiritual term. You will never fix it economically. You will never fix it with financial means. There is no government subsidies. There is not enough charity in this world to fix poverty. The only solution to poverty in the world today is Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God and the way in which he establishes his kingdom because it is a spiritual problem, not an economic problem. Yet for some reason, we, along the way, in the last 2,000 years of church history, have convinced ourselves that poverty is a blessing and a virtue to be pursued. Incorrect. Try again. (laughs) The fact of the matter is that Jesus placed us by grace in his garden to flourish. And you know what? It was a demonstration of God's wisdom to do that. And once again, he's placed the church by grace as the evidence of his manifold wisdom and the evidence that Jesus is Lord. And he's pointing at them, saying, look at my church. They're blessed. They're whole. They're living in peace with God, peace with each other, peace in their marriages, peace in their finances, peace in their health. Look at the manifold wisdom of God displayed in my church. And so we should be pursuing prosperity. But here's the thing. We have isolated prosperity to a financial term. It's not. Prosperity is, is, is financially is, is entry level. That's entry level. Really, prosperity is, is prospering in, in all of our being, in our soul. We need to prosper in our own, in our own health, in our own soul. For, for my liking, and, and I don't want any guilt or condemnation over this, but for my liking, there are too many Christians riddled with anxiety. Anxiety is not, has no legal right in the life of a believer. Depression has no legal right in the life of a believer. Now, that once again, I don't want any shame or guilt over that whatsoever. Uh, just like a, a broken leg has no legal right in the life of a believer, neither does anxiety. Like if we saw a believer with a broken leg, we'd be like, well, that's not right. We need to heal that. Why? Because healing is part of salvation. And so in our own soul, we also need to have a, a, a flourishing or a, a peace, a shalom in our own soul. In our marriages, unfortunately, statistically, Christian marriages are no better than worldly marriages. That shouldn't be. We've got the design. We've got the blueprint. And we've got Holy Spirit in our marriages. That should be the winning edge. In our relationships. Like, like our rela- we should have the best friendships on planet Earth. We should be the most forgiving, gracious understanding, empathetic, long-suffering, loving, joy, peace, happiness. No, no, that that should be the friendships and relationships in the church. Amen. Amen. Who's experienced that in church? It's possible and it should be that way. Why? Because prospering in our relationships is the plan. We, We shouldn't be acting like the world, falling out with each other and being all ugly to each other. We, we, should be, we should be the most patient, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. Yes. Some people are like, well, I need to bear with some people at church, i tell you that. <laughs> yes, you do. But you've got Holy Spirit and you've got the blood of Jesus Christ. And so you should be flourishing in that area. Because it's by grace that you've been empowered. I pray that your soul prospers. I pray that you may prosper even as your soul prospers. As it is in heaven relates to every single area of our life. You know, David himself said, your loving kindness is better than life. Your loving kindness is better than life. That, if we were to chuck that into New Testament Greek, you could easily translate and say that your grace is better than life. And it is. The grace of Jesus Christ, once it comes and it hits your heart, His grace is just better. You live in His grace. You're empowered by His grace. To, to live in the grace of Jesus Christ is just... It's just the most phenomenal way to live. It's, it's, it's better than all that life has to offer. 
You know, we looked at rest, that actually rest is one of the major themes of the Old Testament, that once Adam was kicked out of the garden, he was in labor, he was in toil, it was by the sweat of his brow that he was to meet his own need. Like I said, Cain started killing Abel, they started falling out with each other, strife entered into not only Adam himself, you imagine Adam, you meant to, you, let's talk about mental health for a moment, Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening every day and then was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Can you imagine his own internal turmoil, his own internal strife. Talk about regret. The wrestle that man and that woman would have had. God, why didn't I listen? When they saw the whole world, and it's not like they had a good 70 years to deal with it either. They had centuries of looking back in regret. Men started falling out with each other. The, the, the economic system got all turned upside down. There was never enough. They started fighting over resource. There's now the Babylonian system. The Babylonian system always operates on scarcity. Scarcity is an economic term. Literally, that's what, the, that's what drives the markets is scarcity. Yeah, it, it, the less of something, the more it's worth. Scarcity drives the Babylonian market. Now, I'm going to have a look at the difference between Jerusalem and Babylon another time, but just to, there's a Babylonian economic system. It's driven by scarcity. The economic system of heaven is driven by abundance. There's always more than enough. Like Adam didn't go to one of the trees in the Garden of Eden and God was like, you know what, just, uh, you might have to skip dinner tonight, lad. Um, haven't got enough. Wait till tomorrow, it'll grow back. No, there would have been more than enough in that Garden of Eden. For seconds, thirds, buffet style. Like it would have been eat street markets on steroids, like anything you wanted. A good pad thai, red duck curry. I would have gone to red duck curry. I would have gone to that tree. <laughs> Abundance is, is, is the formula. But see, God, Jesus had to come back and instill rest. And so he used Israel to do that. Let, let me give you a quick snapshot of Old Testament history. Adam lost rest. So God chose Abraham and said, out of this mountain, I'm going to create a nation. And through that nation, I'm going to bring salvation to the world. I'm going to use them as a light to the Gentiles and bring salvation through Israel, the nation. But Israel, the nation, didn't quite work out. So then he chose a tribe. He said, right through the tribe of Judah, I'm going to do it through the tribe of Judah. But the tribe of Judah had its own internal troubles and turmoils. It didn't quite work out. So he said, all right, I'm going to choose a family. I'm going to choose the family. I'm going to choose King David through that family. But then David's family and he himself messed up several times. And so he said, I'm going to use one, the seed, singular. The seed through David, I'm going to bring salvation to the world through that one seed. It went from a nation, down to a tribe, down to a family, down to an individual man, Messiah, Jesus Christ. And through that one man, now salvation comes through, through the whole world. So what Adam lost, the second Adam regained. And the main thing that he regained is rest. All throughout Israel's history, so I'm going to bring you to the land of rest. I'm going to give you to the land of promise. I've already secured it for you. Even before the foundation of the world was even made, I made you a land of rest. It's eternally yours, but they failed to enter into it. And then in Hebrews chapter 4, Paul, outlining that history, he says this. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. In other words, the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. But the word which they heard, it did not profit them. Do you know, it's possible to hear the promise of God that he's already given to you, already secured for you, and it not profit you. It's possible to have a promise of healing, peace, prosperity, and flourishing, yet it not profit you because you didn't mix it with faith. And you didn't mix it with obedience. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Well, I don't believe in prosperity. Okay, that's fine. I'll have yours. You're not going to need it with that attitude. And you're certainly not going to access it with that attitude. How come two Christians, one can be completely living in the promises of God, the other one not? Now, not only and isolated to a lack of faith, but I tell you what, it's in there. And once again, if you're not... If you're not uh, living a life, if you're not living in the promise that God has given you, don't, don't, don't walk into guilt and shame on that. Romans 8.1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Just learn to run better. Learn to run the race of faith better. Learn to do the fight of faith better. It's not easy. 
It's, it, it, it's quite simple. God said it. I believe it, but it's not easy. You've got to learn to pursue, run, and chase. But it is possible to have promises in this book that you do not lay a hold of because you simply just don't believe it. Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. How does faith come? By hearing. What are you feeding on? What's your hearing filled with? Is it filled with the promise of God? Is it filled with the faithfulness of God? Is it filled with the surety of the hope of Jesus Christ? Or are you just filling your hearing with the lack of the world, with the scarcity of the world, with the fear of the world? We're raised in a, in a world filled with fear. It's fear 24-7. I can't remember last time I watched the news. Has anything happened recently that I need to know about? Oh, there's a coronation last night. Yeah, yeah. Well, I watched that. Uh, I don't, but I don't, watch the, I don't watch the news. You know what? Uh, I believe my life is better for it because I haven't got a daily dose of fear going into my mind. <coughs> don't get me wrong. Stay informed. I'm not saying live ignorantly in this world. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying uh, learn how to live in, in an understanding of this world without yet being filled with fear constantly in your daily dose of, of fear and anxiety. Well, I'm all worried, I'm all stressed out, I'm all filled with anxiousness. Well, what are you filling your ear hearing with? Are you filling it with the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the hope of Jesus Christ, the surety of His Word? Faith comes by hearing. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as He has said. God's already provided the rest. We just simply need to enter into it. And how do we enter into it? The same as the... Model was for the Israelites by faith and obedience. I'm stepping into this promised land. There were 12 spies sent out. 10 of them said, not possible. God is not good enough. Two of them said, yes, God is good enough and he has given us this land. Who entered in? The two. Who didn't enter in? The 10. Were they both God's people? Yes. Were they both chosen? Yes. Were the 10 and the 2, both the elect of God, delivered from Egypt and given the promised land? Yes, but who entered in? The 2 that believed God. The 2 that said, it is possible. They, They read God's word. They filled their mind with what the Lord had said and said, it is possible that we will prosper. We will prosper in this land. Let's have a look at this. Let's let's turn to, I haven't got these scriptures. I just want you to look at this pattern. I want to, so get your Bibles, and if you haven't brought your Bibles, just look on with a Christian next to you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Look on your iPhones. I, I want you to have a look at Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalm 24. Ready? <clears throat> Let's have a look. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What does that ring a bell of? The crucifixion, right? So Psalm 22 is actually all about the crucifixion. If you you read through Psalm 22, a lot of it is prophetically depicting the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. What comes after Psalm 22? Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What happens in Psalm 22 makes way for Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is a picture of kingdom living in this age. You and I live in Psalm 23. Because Jesus lived Psalm 22, you and I get to live Psalm 23. What happens in Psalm 24? Let's have a look. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The world and all those who dwell in it. You go down to the end of Psalm 24. Lift up your your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up everlasting doors. The King of glory shall come in. What's it talking about? The millennial reign. Psalm 22 is the crucifixion. Psalm 23 is kingdom living right now. Psalm 24 is the millennial reign. They have read in chronological order. So where are we right now? Psalm 23. What's the basis of Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. He's he's our Lord, He's our God, He's our King. We are obedient to Him. We live according to His laws and His statutes. We follow Him wherever He goes. What's the result of following Jesus? I shall not have any bare needs or necessities because He'll give us just enough to scrape by. I shall not lack any good thing. 
I shall not want. Well, you shouldn't ask God for your wants. You should only ask God for your needs. I got kids. They ask me for what they want (laughs) all the time. And if they ask me for what they need, I'm a bad dad. Dad, can I please have a roof over my head? Well, let me think about that, son. I'm going to have to go away and contemplate that request. Have you been good enough for you to live in your own room this week? My, my, my son, my children don't ask me for their needs. They ask me for their wants. And if somehow we've got it into our Christian thinking that we can't ask Father God for our wants. But Scripture plainly says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in fields that have one or two tufts of green grass. He leads me beside muddy puddles, which if I boil really carefully and put some antibacterial tablets in, maybe I could have a drink. No. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. He makes me wander in wilderness and going around and meeting my own needs and making sure that I'm dry and parched and living in anxiety. No. It's not kingdom living. What are we designed to live in? Kingdom. Yet our religious mindsets have robbed us from the greatest expression of salvation and that is the kingdom is now. But we're so caught up in living in a Babylonian mindset in the concept of scarcity and fear that we forget that we actually live at the abundance of heaven. We live in, 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 the, in the shepherding of God supplying all of our wants. Our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, our marriages. Sure, it includes finances, no doubt. But it's so much more than that. So much more than that. We live in the prospering word of God. Let, let's just do a quick overshoot of Scripture. Because whenever I start talking about Christians being blessed... There's always, you know, one or two religious demons that kind of jump up and try to, you know, just shout me down. Um, and so let me just let Scripture speak for itself, all right? Let, let's see if God actually wants His people blessed. Let's have a look at Leviticus 26, verses 3 to 5. Leviticus, I'm going to shoot through these. These notes are available on the app if you want to go back and study them. I encourage you to do that. Always check if your pastor is a heretic um, and make sure that you do your own study. Don't just take my word for it. Make sure you do your own study. Uh, see if I'm making it up. Uh, Google me. Not, not, uh, not as in don't Google me, like Google what I'm saying is what I mean. <laughs> Leviticus 26, verse 3 to 5. If you walk in my statute, statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. So in the Old Testament, it was obedience that led to flourishing. It was obedience that led to flourishing. Was it obedience in the Old Testament that only led to a promise that one day, someday, you get to be with Jesus, but until then, you've got to live in a dry and barren land, living by the sweat of your own brow? No. The promise even for the old covenant believers was, hey, if you live in covenant with me, I promise you, your harvest is going to be bountiful. So much so it's going to last until the next harvest. And again and again, and your vats are going to overflow, your silos are going to be full. There was always a flourishing for the people of God, even in the old covenant. Who has the better covenant? We've got the better covenant. Ours is better. In the old covenant, they got blessed by their obedience. In the new covenant, we get blessed by Jesus' obedience. Because he was obedient to the cross, you and I are now blessed. We're now blessed, not because of your performance, but because of his performance. And we now apprehend that by grace through faith. Let's have a look at Philippians 4.19. And my God shall supply all your needs according to the lower socioeconomic class of how you can get by in your economy. No. Is that, that what it says? Why do, we, why do we insert that definition then? Why, why are you inserting that into your understanding of Scripture? Because it plainly says there, the measuring stick of supply will be His riches and glory. Last time I checked, Jesus was pretty rich. He, he has a buck or two. 
Well, actually, I should say shekels because he's Jewish. He's got quite a few shekels. Is this good news to anyone? I'm just checking. God's going to supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. Yet we minimize his supply down to, oh, that's okay, that, that's enough. And I get that, you know, we've we got to build generationally on the blessing. Jacob was richer than Isaac. Isaac was richer than Abraham. Blessing increases. And so we in our generation of Christians, we should be walking in a greater blessing than the Christians have gone before. But we shouldn't be looking at the previous generations that had to fight for bread on their table and being like, well, that's enough. That's all that God can do. No, no, bread on their table for a previous generation was breakthrough faith. But it's not our breakthrough faith. They already broke through on that. We're now multiplying on what they've already broken through. Let, let's, do some, let's do some real quick flyover because the keys player is there and I need to hurry up. Actually, I've got a whole bunch of verses there. You check them out. They're, 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 all, they're all speaking um, around the plan of God. For You look at Deuteronomy 28. I mean, it's just, it's just talking about blessing. Blessed you should be in your city. Blessed you should be in your country. Blessed in the fruit of your body. The produce of your ground. And you know, there was a time Bonnie and I couldn't get pregnant. Well, particularly Bonnie. <laughs> There's, that time is still now that I can't get pregnant. <laughs> We're old school. <laughs> but but, but there, there was a time we weren't blessed in the fruit of our body. And, and, and we, we had to break through on faith on that. And then, then we started having kids without even thinking about it. And we had to like, how do we, how do we wind back this anointing? Like, we got four now. Like, that's enough, Lord. That's, whoa, come on now. More, more, we know you say more than enough, but that really is more than enough. All right, four, four is more than enough. But there was a time we had to break through on that. We had to break through faith on that. We had to stand in faith. We had to apprehend that. Blessed you being the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed you come in, blessed when you go out. You know, this is all talking about, you know, the flourishing that God is, is bringing Israel into. And then there's that famous verse where it says, um, uh, let's go to verse 13. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath. You know, that's talking about money. Because if you back up a verse, it actually says this. The Lord will open up to you His good treasure, the heavens, to give you rain to your land. That's prosperity to a farmer in its season. And bless all the work of your hand. Watch this. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall lend and not borrow. You shall uh, make you the head and not the tail. In other words, you're going to be the borrower, the, the lender, not the borrower. You're going to be the head, not the tail. So when we, when we shout out in our Pentecost, we're going to be the head, not the tail, in the name of Jesus. That's talking financially. That God has blessed you so much, you don't even need to borrow. As a matter of fact, we're lending. That's how, that's how blessed we are. Psalm 34.10, The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. All right. Let's go over here. What's, what's the point? The point is this, that as New Testament believers now, we've already been blessed through Jesus Christ. We're already blessed. So when we're sowing seed, when we're giving, when we're paying our tithes, it, it, it's not to get blessing. We're already blessed. So if you're tithing to get blessing, if you're sowing to get rich, like you, you, you've missed it. That's not the point. We're already blessed. We're already wealthy beyond our wildest dreams, above all we could possibly imagine or ask for or even hope for through Christ Jesus. But now, like the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's a paradox. The paradox is now in the New Testament, we now live to give. We now live in the generosity, the same generosity that Jesus Christ bestowed upon us. It says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, I will, I will read this. I'll be quick. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Moreover, brethren. Now, let me give you the context of this passage. Paul's talking about an offering that was taken up by a church in Macedonia. And the church in Macedonia were broke. They were living in persecution and they were extremely poor. But he's writing to a church in Corinth that are basically middle class. 
He's talking to a fairly wealthy church about an extremely poor church. And he says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality or their generosity. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave to themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete the grace in you as well. But as you abound, watch this. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Giving, generosity, is a grace that we receive from Jesus Christ. It's not by your own hand. It's not by your own performance. It's not by your own career. It's not by your own education. It's a grace that we receive from Jesus Christ. He gives bread to the eater, seed to the sower. If you don't have seed to sow, ask God. He gives it. But then watch the next verse down. Verse 8. I speak not by commandment. In other words, Paul's not saying, as an apostle, I'm telling you to give. Just like me as a pastor, I'm not going to stand at Kingdom Legacy. I'm just saying, me as your pastor, I'm telling you to give to Kingdom Legacy. Now I'm saying what Paul's saying. Look at the example of generosity that we have in church history and in the churches and in the generations that have gone before. Use them as your guide and as your example. But then he also goes on to use another example. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might become rich. Now once again, we've tried to spiritualize that because it doesn't fit with our theology. But actually, Paul's talking about an offering there. And he's saying, the level of your sacrifice needs to also represent our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That even though he was rich, he chose to become poor so that others could become rich. And and so we don't give to get. We've already received. We now live to give through the blessing and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ so that others may also experience the grace of Jesus Christ. That's why we give. That's why we sow. That's why we're generous. And that's why God wants you to prosper. Because a church armed with prosperity in their soul, their minds, their body, and in their resource is a weapon in the hand of Jesus Christ. The measure of giving in a believer's life is the size of the sacrifice, not the size of the gift. Somebody might give $10. Somebody might give $10,000. The measure isn't the quantity. The measure is the sacrifice. Because grace is upon our giving and our sowing and in our lifestyle. It's the lifestyle of a believer. Come on, let's all stand together in the presence of the Lord.